this is an outstanding turnout and I guess we've all come out from our holes and seen our shadows so it's all going to be good uh, this has been an interesting series for me because whenever you deal with important works of literature whether they're in politics philosophy whatever they may be they relate to the human condition and as Christians, we can find points of connection that we can talk about. It's important that we relate to the world around us and be able to discuss things with some degree of intelligence as far as what is going on. Tonight, our study is going to be from 1984. In two weeks, we're going to be following up with a uh, study from a Russian novelist, Dostoevsky, with Crime and Punishment as our series continues. Jordan? Yeah, so as I uh, looked over the assignments, I realized that I had a couple of unhappy novels uh, in, in a row. So uh, I promise that the, the lesson will not be uh, quite as depressing as it might seem at first. Let me click back over to my PowerPoint here. But tonight we are looking at George Orwell's 1984. Uh, most of us are familiar with this work and with the author. Uh, he is almost larger than himself. He is uh, an idea and a concept. We'll get into even the fact that the word Orwellian is sort of a word that we use to describe what he has built here in 1984. Uh, he wrote this near the end of his life. We'll get into a little bit about his biography. We're also going to spend a little bit of time with the structure of these sort of novels as a whole. So with the novel that is a dystopian novel, which is what again, we'll talk a little bit about what that word means, but what was he trying to do? What was he trying to tell people about and what lessons should we take? Uh, so George Orwell, this is his picture here. I'll move, I'll move this just a little bit so it's out of our way for those of us who are looking here. If we can ignore the green bar for a second. So George Orwell is not his real name. A lot of people aren't aware of that. Uh, he is born Eric Arthur Blair, and that is his birth name. And that is the name that he actually used throughout his entire life for personal matters. So he had friends who even reconnected with him towards the end of his life, and they didn't realize until really towards the end that he was actually the same person as George Orwell. They, they didn't realize their childhood friend was this famous novelist. He was uh, English. A uh, very British individual, but he was not born in England. He was born in India on a mission uh, with his father, who was an Anglican cl clergyman. Uh, he adopted the name George Orwell a little bit later. And we'll get into why he did that and where that name comes from in just a second. Uh, but he is sort of a journeyman author. He is not someone who burst onto the scene with this forceful novel and wrote that success for the rest of his life. He was known in uh, social critics, uh, social activism, uh, those sort of circles well before Animal Farm, which some of us might already know, and his last novel, 1984. Uh, so he, again, was sort of an, a known figure by this point. The, the high point of his career is also the end of his career. Uh, he would die uh, right at 1950, a year after 1984 uh, would be published. Again, uh, saying the date uh, kind of Seems a little bit odd to us. It's a date that's in the past now, but at the time it was a future novel, uh, speculating about what the future might hold. Now, uh, after his upbringing and after his time as a young man, he enlisted to fight in the Spanish Civil War. If you know anything about the 20th century, especially the early half when George Orwell lived, you know the Spanish Civil War took place in between both World War I and World War II. Now, this was a war that really, it's, it's sad to say, there weren't really too many good sides uh, the Republicans uh, of, in the Spanish Civil War were not Republicans that we would say today in the United States, Republican or Democrat. They wanted ostensibly a republic, but they were very much allied with the communists. And so they uh, had all sorts of different warring factions, and they were fighting against uh, what would become Franco's government, so the fascists. But again, they were fighting uh, on behalf of the communists. They did some very bad things. Now, George Orwell went to fight for these uh, Republican uh, uh, communists, but he was wounded in action. He was shot in the throat by a sniper. Now, if you see his picture, you can almost kind of tell he is a taller man. He is six foot two, and the average uh, Spaniard is a little bit on the shorter side for a European. So whenever they were digging the trenches to fight the war, they dug them shorter. And whenever he would stand up, 
he would be a head above the people on either side of him. So he ended up getting shot and barely surviving. Now, uh, this is separate from what would later end, end up taking his life. He smoked heavily and ended up with tuberculosis and again dying before the age of 50. Now, because, again, his association with these communist allied forces and his overall health being very poor, he was not able to uh, serve in any official capacity in World War II. Again, this is towards the end of his life. So he was able to focus on his writing. Now, he was interested in government affairs, and he, again, had always been a critic of these different sorts of social circles. So he was interested in the work, but he was not able to continue. Again, shut out of the government, shut out of the army. So he turned to these two novels. Again, first, Animal Farm, and then 1984. Now, with both of these, it's not that Orwell had a new idea. His, his thesis here that we'll get into, that totalitarianism is something to be feared and roundly is bad, is not an, an idea that's unique to Orwell. All of us know that totalitarianism is bad. We don't need him to tell us that. But it's the vivid imagery that he conjures up, and it's his language and his uh, a dark imagination that makes it seem very real and makes the threat seem like something that you have to take an active measure to counteract in your daily life. So he makes the threat of totalitarianism not far away and remote and a possibility, but a certainty that you have to counteract. And that's going to be most of our argument here tonight is, is that true or not? Is, is he right about that? Now, I, I think I heard someone say this, uh, from National Review and an author writing this. He said that George Orwell is every liberal's favorite conservative and every conservative's favorite liberal. Because of the way that he approached socialism, because he was early on in life a very vocal and enthusiastic socialist, but then later moderated and, of course, here at the end wrote some works that were very much against uh, the, po the possible socialist takeover of Europe. Uh, People on the left and the right both see him as sort of a moderating influence for the other side. You know, people on the conservative side kind of say, well, he's he's a progressive and he's a liberal, but I, I like the way he thinks and I like the way he writes. And people on the left say the exact same thing, but assume that he's more of a conservative. So neither side really owns him in that way, but uh, he is definitely an interesting figure. So he, he list of his works, including 1984, uh, first are more direct social commentary, not so much uh, fiction in the way that we would later understand them. Uh, Keep the Aspidistra Flying and the Road to Wigan Pier. The first novel looks at the British middle class. Uh, Aspidistra is a little plant that kind of is in the same way that people here in the United States might have those little fake silk plants to symbolize like we are a middle class household. And in the same way in the United Kingdom, they would have the, these Aspidistra plants. And so he was critiquing the idea of a middle class that was attached to and moored to things that weren't really real, but would very much hesitate to give those up. With the Road to Wigan Pier, he's looking at the lower class. Now, he was always very much, again, as a self avowed socialist and someone who was interested in left-leaning politics, he would uh, express that he was standing up for the lower classes, as people on the left often do attempt to do, but he was never really embraced by them. He was very much an academic. He was educated at Eton, very prestigious school. And so it's very interesting. Uh, members of his family would later write that whenever they would try and go out and take uh, George Orwell with them to like go out to a bar or go out to a restaurant, and some of them were lower class themselves, he would be the least popular guy in the room, even though he's trying to stand up for these people and write for these people because he is so much an academic and a writer, he is not really a member of the lower class. And we'll get into that in just a second here. Down and out in Paris and London, kind of that phrase down and out has survived uh, even this novel here. Uh, but the idea here is that Orwell is trying to lend himself some credence to the idea that, well, really, I was a member of the lower class for a minute. He had a very short career as a policeman in Burma, in, in British Burma. And obviously, that's not what we know him for today. He didn't, uh, it didn't work out super well there. He had a lot of personal interactions that didn't go super well. He sometimes was a little bit aggressive in terms of his romantic life, in terms of his friendships, and so burned a couple of bridges and left Burma, which again, to the credit of, of the world, we ended up with him as the writer instead of him as the policeman. So ultimately a good move. Uh, now, down and out in Paris and London, he was impoverished for maybe a couple of weeks to a couple of months uh, while he was moving around again obviously in Paris and London. 
and put together a novel describing that. What's very interesting here is the first draft of this novel went to an editor who we know, his name's T.S. Eliot, and he rejected the novel and said, you need to work on this some more and maybe we don't publish this right now. And so he ended up cleaning it up and, and working on that a little bit, but it's very sad to have T.S. Eliot tell you no. Uh, the last novel is A Clergyman's Daughter. Uh, Orwell was, again, not opposed to religion in as much as he was, you know, an atheist as the rest of the communists were, but he never really abandoned that anti-religious bent that infected so much of the, the communist movement. So he was more aggressively against English Christianity, where it was a, a totem of the upper classes, where it was, you know, good people do this and we observe the form and the function and our personal lives are something different. And that's something that a lot of us might even empathize with, where people are using Christianity as a totem of being, you know, good people roundly, but not really convicted Christians, we, we wouldn't like that either. And so again, his argument was too forceful and he was too much against religion. But again, some of the criticism that he said that he had are criticisms that we might end up sharing. Uh, the image here is the River Orwell, which is what he took his name from. He just thought that George Orwell was, he said it sounded like a good round English name. And so he settled on it so he could publish again these novels that might not reflect as well on his family and on his friends, uh, at least his initial works, uh, under a pen name. 1984 is his last novel. It's published in 1949. He dies in 1950. So he never really gets to see uh, the renewal and the energy behind the latter half of his career. Uh, now, this is definitely the novel through which most people know and understand Orwell, even if they have not read it. So even if you haven't read this book, you probably already knew what it's about. You can probably even summarize the plot roughly, what, what little plot there is, uh, to look at Orwell's argument against totalitarianism. You know roughly what he's going to say. And again, just in the same way that if we talk about an Orwellian society, we, we know exactly what we're getting into, even without reading the book. So again, we're going to get into this in just a little bit, the idea of a dystopian novel. So what does that mean? Well, it's the opposite of utopia. And we'll explore both of those ideas here shortly. Now, Orwell was, at one point, a utopian. He believed in a worldwide socialist revolution that would equalize the classes and make everyone to some extent, happier and better taken care of. He would really revolt against that idea later on. A lot of people who are taken in by utopian ideas whenever they're young, as they grow older, maybe with maturity comes a little bit more wisdom and they realize that's a very risky, very dangerous idea. And we'll talk about that more in just a few minutes. So again, looking at this novel, at its place in time. Again, World War II has been concluded. It's 1949. Now, Europe is absolutely not what we would say at peace. The war is over, but Europe's being carved up into these spheres of influence that, in a way, continue even to today. Again, this past week has been fantastically interesting in terms of the first really major shift in European politics uh, since the fall of the Berlin Wall and since the collapse of the Soviet Union. They're realigning themselves for the first time in almost 30 years. And so it's fantastic to observe and a little scary, but definitely fantastic to observe. So again, looking at Orwell's time, he is seeing people have their individual, their, their individualism, their individuality, and their expression stripped away without their consent. And we'll talk about that specifically in just a little bit. But again, think about that. Think about if you're someone living in Poland and your side, roughly speaking, wins the war. The, the axis is defeated. But for you, it doesn't matter. Your government is given away to the Soviet Union and you no longer have a choice. So you either leave your country, abandon your family, your home, your, your friends, or you submit to being a Soviet citizen. You can call it being a citizen, a subject. And so again, who you are is no longer uh, your choice. And so again, that is really the fear and that is the argument. It all comes down to choice. Now, this is Orwell's photographer's Burmese passport. And it, it's a little interesting if you notice uh, the similarities between his face here and his description eventually of Big Brother. And we'll get into who Big Brother is in just a minute. But he, he calls Big Brother a stern but concerned, uh, concerned mustachioed English face. And again, here we go. We have exactly such a thing. So uh, stern but concerned, maybe. 
So what is dystopia? And again, this is a, a, a genre that did not start with Orwell, was not, maybe, maybe people would argue, not even uh, expressed in its highest form by Orwell, but he has definitely given us the biggest example. 1984 is probably the landmark example of a dystopian work of fiction. Now, it's the opposite of utopia. Uh, it's the opposite of wish fulfillment. So whenever children read Harry Potter, every single one of them wants to place themselves in that novel. It, it's a work of fiction, but you want to be there. You know, every kid reads Harry Potter and they think, what house would I be in? What would my little spell Patronus be? It, it would be so fun. Nobody wants this. This book is about how do I stop this from happening? I, I see this world and any part of it that seems close to me and seems real isn't fun. It's very scary and I need to stop it. Now, in just the same way, with utopia, people like to imagine themselves in charge or bringing about the utopia. In Plato's Republic, he talks about the philosopher kings. And everybody who reads the Republic thinks, well, I would make a pretty good philosopher king. And here, again, even the people in charge are not happy, are not good people, are not really in charge of themselves. The, the inner party that we'll talk about in just a little bit are not pleased with this arrangement. And nobody who reads 1984 should walk away with the understanding, well, if I was in the inner party and I was running things, it would be different. The point of a dystopia is that the entire system is just producing misery. And you, if you understand the illusion that he's making, you have to stop it. So again, dystopia is made stronger, the more realistic it is. If you're just making a straw man argument, a straw man being uh, a fake little um, not real argument that you put up just so you can defeat it. So if I was trying to make the weakest possible argument for my opponents, and then I, I, I break it down. So if dystopia is thin and dystopia is weak, it doesn't scare you and it doesn't motivate you in the same way. 1984 is different because it really should have points that you think, well, that seems like someone that we do today. That seems like someone that we could do tomorrow. And I think that we need to stop it. So the problem here becomes with dystopia, it really becomes a canvas that you put your enemies on. So, you know, Liberals might, might read 1984 and go, well, this is what's going to happen if the conservatives won one more election. It's going to fall apart. They're going to take over. Conservatives might read 1984 and say, oh, my goodness, this is what's going to happen. If the progressives won one more election, they're going to take over. And so people project maybe their enemies onto dystopia, not unfairly. Again, you should think of your own arguments as correct. I think that's natural. But again, maybe don't get carried away with that and understand why other people might view things uh, differently than you do. Importantly here, this is not something that we should become hysterical over. Again, reading this book should not make you break down and, and stop realizing that the world around you is still the world around you and not this fictional world that he has created. Again, James 4, 1 through 4. Uh, we won't take a break to, to read that, but again, we have an entirely different uh, view of the world than the world does. And so in, in a way, we view this entire arrangement and this entire system with a different set of stakes than they do. We understand the ultimate stakes as the soul. The soul is what's eternal and the soul is what we're very much invested in. Whereas for the world, this might be even scarier because this is all they have. And so whereas we're able to view this with a more detached eye and look at it from a distance, this is very scary for them. And so again, whenever people get hysterical about it, for example, in the past couple of years, it's been very common to use allusions from The Handmaiden's Tale to criticize Christianity and, broadly speaking, conservative positions. Now, that is a novel that, again, wears a little thin in terms of the straw man argument. It's, it's a little ridiculous. The premise is that the United States votes to become a Christian theocracy and brutally oppress women. I don't think that's going to happen today or tomorrow or ever. But again, people get carried away. There are all sorts of protesters who dress up like those characters. And to them, that is a truth. And again, why are they so invested? Why did they get carried away? Because this is all they have. And they're very worried about the world that they live in. Again, not a bad thing, but they've clearly gone over the edge a little bit with dystopia. So important to understand, but don't let it scare you too much and don't let it break you down uh, in such a way. Now, getting into the actual text of the novel, we're going to take a look at the world of 1994 and what makes it different than the world that we live in today. 
hopefully, or is it different than what we live in today? And that'll be part of what we're looking at here. This is uh, an image from a Chinese uh, security system. They use uh, a lot of tracking technology to tag different individuals, cars, license plates, transactions, and so forth. And we'll talk about a little bit what that looks like today. This is the backbone of what they call their social credit system, where you're assigned an invisible score. And uh, in the same way, we might have a credit score for the bank. They have one in terms of your personal and political actions, which is a lot scarier. So what is 1984 and what has happened that makes it so much different than our timeline, if you will? Well, in this timeline, there was a socialist worldwide revolution, broadly speaking. It bears very little similarity to the socialism that we would um, understand and interact with in the world today at present. But again, the aims of the socialist uh, world revolution as we saw in the Soviet Union and as we see with people who still try to practice and preach socialism is ultimately something similar to this. So again, uh, something that would not be completely alien to Orwell's audience and even to his own beliefs at one point. So the world here has been divided into three countries. Oceania is where we are. Uh, it contains the United States, uh, most of Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, of course, England, uh, Eurasia and East Asia are the other countries. They are also as uh, completely morally bankrupt. They are also totalitarian states and life is equally miserable everywhere in the world. There is no escape. So again, this is calling to mind the, the fall of the old European order and the creation of something new under the Soviet states. Again, the idea there is nowhere to run. Well, if you're living in Estonia, you can say, well, you know, I don't live in Russia. Well, it doesn't matter anymore. It, it's all gone. Your country is gone. Everything that you thought you could leave and go 